Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located. Before we get started, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's the CC, CC button at the bottom of your screen, and that's for closed captioning. So if you need closed captioning, please uh, click there, and I'll give you a moment to do so. Thank you. My name is Lisa Coleman and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Thank you for joining us for today for our NYU Be Together Global Scholars and Innovators conversation with Dr. C. Riley Snorton. We're extremely excited for this conversation. Please note that this program is also being recorded and will be posted on our uh, Office of Global Inclusion YouTube page. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with Dr. Snorton as part of our uh, Global Innovators and series and part of our Be Together initiative with today's program taking place on and honoring Trans Day of Visibility, also known as TDEV. TDEV is an annual celebration of the trans and non-binary community, highlighting achievements, contributions to society, as well as a raising awareness of the stigma and discrimination that is faced every day. We hope that together we use this day to reflect on identity, purpose, and how we can, can uplift and make visible the lives and contributions of trans and non-binary communities in our daily action, in our research, in our programs, in our other aspects of our lives all year round, and how do we continue to provide the support to these communities as we know there has been violence directed toward these communities and as we think about this COVID-19 era in particular the differential impacts so how do we continue to ensure that we are being not only supportive but ensuring that the work of people of trans and non-binary communities is recognized as always, I have to thank my amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation at NYU, some of whom are uh, here right now. And as I always say, I, I have the absolute pleasure of working with an amazing team, an amazingly committed team. And uh, thank you so much for all the work that you do each and every day to support our community at NYU and beyond. I want to specifically thank the LGBTQ plus center within the Office of Global Inclusion, in particular, Chris Woods. Chris, you're a rock star. Thank you for everything that you do all day. Uh, you do so much work for our community, and I am so appreciative to Christopher, Christopher Griffin. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for all of your incredible work. And of course, to the graduate students and the entire team, just thank you. I also want to recognize that this is the 25th anniversary of the LGBTQ uh, LGBTQ plus center and we are thrilled we have a number of initiatives uh, happening and I know they just, dro just dropped in the chat uh, some information about the LGBTQ plus center we hope you'll visit uh, we have a fundraising initiative and a lot of things happening this year so please join us for that celebration thank you again to the team so let me begin with the way that I always do I hope that everyone is taking good care people keep saying that this is a new normal it's not normal it's been stressful. We've seen stresses in terms of health, uh, home, in terms, in terms of it being at home, in our care for others and ourselves, our colleagues, and so on. I've been saying that what we need is a new different, a new different that recognizes the disparate impacts, the urgency, and we move to action instead of rhetoric, and we move toward transformation that emphasizes right equity and thinking about how we continue to uplift and serve those who have been disp disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and others into other legacies of oppression and suppression. Before moving into the program, I would also like to acknowledge all of our frontline workers whose, li whose labor is often unseen and who continue to, con con continue to sacrifice for all of our well-being, including our healthcare workers, those who clean and maintain our hospitals, our facilities, our public transportation, those who deliver our packages and delivery services, all of the essential workers who support us, care for us, and allow for us to care for ourselves. Thank you. We know that we could not be doing any of the things that we do. We could not be at all without you. Thank you. 
I would also like to just take a brief moment to honor those who've come before us, our ancestors, whose, uh, upon whose unseen lab labor, excuse me, many of our institutions are built, and uh, acknowledge all of those lives that have been lost in terms of violence, those known to us and unknown to us. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the labor that, uh, I mean, the land upon which our institutions uh, now sit and occupy. We now acknowledge that we are gathered here in this virtual space, that many of our institutions and campuses are located on the unceded lands of indigenous peoples, including those on whose land NYU's campuses are located. NYU also acknowledges, and we acknowledge that the university is an institution created in the United States, which was founded on the uh, exclusion and erasures of many indigenous peoples, as well as the dis discounted labor of so many uh, of what we might call people of color uh, and the legacies of their work. We continue our efforts to both recognize and dismantle the systematic and systemic exclusions that have occurred historically. We would also like to honor those uh, whose lives, as I've just said, have gone, lost ongoing systemic forms of oppression and violence due to racism, cis sexism and xenophobia and those uh, across the globe. I'd like to take a moment of silence to, in honor and reflection. Thank you. I am now honored to introduce our guest, Dr. C. Riley Snorton. Dr. Snorton is the interim faculty director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago, where he is a professor of English language and literature and gender and sexuality studies. Professor Snorton is a cultural theorist who focuses on racial, sexual, and transgender histories and cultural production. He is the author of Nobody is Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low and Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity. By the way, the books are right here. If you have not read the books, get the books. They're amazing. Uh, he is also the co-editor of Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value. In 2020, Snorton became the co-editor of GLQ, a journal of LGBTQ studies. Today, we are going to be focusing much of our discussion on, 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 on the book Black on Both Sides, excuse me, a trans, a racial history of trans identity. Uh, please, as I just said, if you've not read this transformational book, we really hope that you do and that you engage in the discourse and dialogue, dialogue with your peers and colleagues. And this, as we've already said, this video will be available on our, uh, on our website. We've just dropped the links to the uh, books in the chat, so please avail yourself of that as well. We'll be taking questions, which will be answered uh, at the end of the program. You can submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom. And given the size of the audience, we'll be doing our best to get to as many questions as possible, but we will also group questions that are similar to cover as many as possible, given time restraints. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. C. Riley Sir. Hello. Hello. Wow. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction. Thank you um, to uh, everyone for this invitation. I'm so thrilled uh, to be here and to be in conversation with you. Oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. And as I said earlier to you, uh, your books are truly, truly wonderful and so well researched and well done. So uh, this isn't about me. So let's get into the conversation. So Dr. Snorton, beyond your bio, can you share with us a little bit about your academic, professional, and personal journey that led you to being here with us today? And particularly at this point in your career in terms of, like I've already read your bio, right? In terms of the, the accolades and particularly now being, of course, um, uh, working on the GLQ and, uh, and then of course, the, you know, getting to these books. Ah, thank you. Um, so uh, I think, the first place to start is to say I was raised by my mother, who at the time that I was a child was a public defender, and my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother also had many different jobs, but um, most closely identified with being an English teacher. Uh, my grandfather um, was an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, starting at a very early age, I ended up 
like leaving New York City where my family is from and moving to rural South Carolina um, to, to live on our 40 acre family property with extended family members. And so my life was really filled with family, but also with books and vinyl records. And so um, there's a sensibility both in, Nova, in uh, Nobody's Supposed to Know and Black on Both Sides. They're both actually musical references. Um, and I often think, um, you know, uh, props to the, to the DJ at the beginning for, for offering us Mary J. Bly's Real, Real Love. But I, I, I wonder, and I often, and I often think with, um, you know, the, po the, the poetry of, of hip hop and R&B, um, as part of the kind of soundscape of, of the thinking. Um, I guess I think that the, what is uh, perhaps obvious um, for, for many is that, you know, I think of uh, where I am now as being um, a kind of collective process in so many ways. I, I often tell, um, you know, my students that the single author on the spine of a book is a myth, that there's so, so many collectivities of thinking that um, allow for something like that to, to be published and to circulate in the world. Uh, but I also think, you know, very much I've been shaped by so many contexts as a kind of political being who also was engaged in a scholarly practice, and those things have never been um, disarticulated. And so what it means now to be a co-editor of GLQ or to be a fac uh, the interim director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture is about, um, in, it, from, a, from a very personal place, is about reckoning with what it means to have gotten to this stage in my career and what it means to continue to um, be in a process of both uh, thinking and working collectively, but also being um, related to power, not only as something that um, one exercises, but but something that one has to be accountable to. And so I think a lot about, you know, like um, what it means to wrap my mind around the fact that uh, the this book, Black on Both Sides, I think in particular, has been very meaningful to others. And I also think, you know, I have my own kinds of um, shifting relations to the text as well, but it gives me a sense that like, you know, um, the work that it, that it has done and, and hopefully will continue to do is, um, is, is well, is in some ways well beyond me. And, and that is in, in one really big sense, like a great relief that like it can be of use and it can be rethought and it can be um, what I often think any writing can be, which is an invitation to a conversation. Um, so, so I'll pause there because I think that like, you know, uh, there are lots of, I, I feel like I'm kind of um, wanting to talk a little bit about uh, some of the desires that I have for the book, but I also want to sit with the question that you asked about um, just kind of a sense of how I locate myself in, in this particular time and place. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for also Rex, for saying that about the collective process of what it means to even get to this point, because I yeah. think so you're right so many times, and especially for some of our students out there, it's not an isolation, it's not an isolation, it's kind of activity, right? Um, so, um, and, uh, and um, we'll come back to some of these questions about reckoning with power and, of course, your desires for the book, because we don't want that to get lost. Um, so one of the things that we focus on a lot in the work that we do here at NYU is this idea of transformation. Mm -hmm. And we pull it out of the context of South, the South African idea of transformation, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about truth and reconciliation, which always starts with truth. I like to remind people of it. So, uh, so in the preface to your uh, to your book, uh, Black on Both Sides, uh, A Racial History of Trans Identity, you speak about how this book is, a, quote, an attempt to find a vocabulary for Black and trans life, end quote. And when so uh, often narratives and histories of Black trans people are misunderstood through a lens of Black and trans death, and what I talk about is like deficit models, right, the problem that needs to be solved, etc. And so you speak, for example, of an quote unquote, uh, unethical grammar and a movement toward a traditional grammar, a transformational grammar, traditional, oh my goodness, transformational grammar of black trans life, 
joy and resilience. Could you talk to us a little bit about that for the people who haven't read the book, yeah. but also tell us a little bit about why that's significant, right? As you, in, in terms of the country, in terms of what you hope that contributes to the discourse. Thanks. Um, so I wanna maybe start actually with someone who was a faculty person at NYU. Um, and what I see as a kind of enduring insight from Cruising Utopia, where he is figuring uh, a, uh, 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 yeah, right? Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, he, Jose was on my committee now. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was I mean, one of my advisors. Wow, wow. Yeah, I, sorry I, about that. No, yeah. no, no. I mean, I think, I think it, all of that, right? And also that I, you know, I, I have been so fortunate to have been um, in his company and to have, have benefited from his insight. And I would consider him um, certainly in the kind of words of Toni Morrison, a friend of my mind. Um, but there's something, you know, especially in Cruising Utopia that I find myself returning to often in terms of what is being actually framed in that project. And, you know, a court of like across Munoz's work is a real commitment to survival. And in Cruising Utopia, he frames a, 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 an encounter, an exchange between kind of survivalist modes of theory and pragmatist forms of theory. And I've been really just sitting with how um, ongoingly meaningful that is for us to kind of sit with uh, that kind of paradigm. Because in one sense, I'm interested in, um, you know, and I think it's, it's in fact, one of the luxuries of being a scholar is to, to really not have to be immediately concerned with whether something is pragmatic. Um, you know, part of, I think, the work of, of writing, and, and this is nonfiction and, and, and science fiction, and, and I think there are many ties to make between something like theory and science fiction, is about nurturing our radical, wildest imaginaries. Um, but I was also thinking a little bit about uh, and I was reminded of uh, a, a phrase that Audre Lorde um, offered up when she was talking about survival. And she said, by survival, I do not mean mere existence, but an active quality of living. Survival means living with focus. And so much of um, the kind of work of conceptualizing Black on both sides had to do with maybe we can look to the past to reinvigorate strategies for Black and trans survival. Um, survival not as the kind of foil to something like thriving, but survival as a, a, in, the, in the ways that I think Lord and Munoz have offered. And I'll add just one other kind of citational note to that to, as by way of response, which is that for me, um, my favorite definition of theory is one that Homi Baba um, has offered, which is that theory is simply words for living. And so much of the kind of argument, but also I think the narratives, the figures that show up in Black, Black on Both Sides are really about um, you know, thinking about how people um, practice the kind of art of survival in what seemed like impossible circumstances, circumstances that felt incredibly foreclosed. That is another way of perhaps indexing what grammar is, you know, as a kind of um, language of, of signs, of the law of signs, that what does it mean to not actually um, approach what, what, um, uh, what might be perceived as a kind of traditional grammar or the grammar of the law of the state or the grammar of, uh, of uh, um, all the ways that the kind of colonial modes of gender structure people's lives, but to offer up a grammar from the lived experiences of uh, Black and trans people in the past. Um, and, and what, you know, it's like, even as we, I think, are in fact forced to be literate of these other kinds of grammars, that we, we also are and can continue to nurture and develop alternative grammars for living yeah. in, in this moment, which I guess, let me go back to Munoz and say again, one of the things that is enduring about Cruising Utopia is that the future is now, that we're like, that, that we, are, we are working in the future 
in the present. And, and so I, I, I think about that as also a kind of collapse of time, that these are ancestors that I've been, uh, these are ancestors for, for, for folks who identify as Black and trans, but they are also, they are also um, folks that give us pathways to a future of more of, of a, a future in which there is the possibility of the experience of living more freely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for talking about that situated grammar, situated thinking about that, right, and the specificity, because I think far too often we're not clear, right, in how that sort of gets right played out and um, in particular in bodies and lives of different communities. And I want to just say, Jose, Jose, Jose. I mean, thank you for thank you for referencing his work. He was an amazing person, and I think you're right. The legacy of his work is enduring. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in uh, so let's talk. One of the things that's really also beautiful about your book is the way that you and you did it just now when you were talking about Jose and and Audrey and uh, and all of right, the ways you bring, right, these sort of, you collapse time in some ways in your book by bringing these people, I mean, from Nikki Giovanni, I mean, you got everybody, I'm telling you. So, so I'm, 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 I was fascinated by that, but I'm also fascinated by what you were able to do with some of those, yet yeah, those figures of um, the oppressors. And so my next question is, as you know, about J. Marion Sims. Yeah. So, so, for those who don't out there, J. Marion Sims was an enslaver and a doctor who, for, uh, who was considered sort of the father of modern gynecology. His test subjects were black enslaved women. Uh, there were uh, horrific things that were done. And for those of you out there who haven't read about this, I, I just, I can't say enough, but, um, and then when we think about the, the way in the, which gynecology then gets uh, played out in terms of hysterectomies and all of those kinds of things. But in the first chapter of your book, you share the history about how this was right, built on black women's um, suffering. And in particular, the ways in which black women's bodies were technologized, right? In terms of reproduction of labor, production of med medical knowledge um, that then is then claimed, right, by the doctors themselves. So you have this sort of usurping, right? Yeah. And then, um, and then so, and then later in history, these women are memorialized in particular ways, right? And you offer moments like the great uh, moments in medicine series by, uh, 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 by, uh, by Anarka becoming known as the mother of, of gynecology. Could you just share with us a little bit about talking and bringing these stories and talking about, right, what happens with Betsy and Lucy and those who are unnamed and why yeah. this is so important to the intersectional histories yeah. as we think about sort of the um, gender, race, yeah. right, sexuality, identity. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Um, I wanna start by, um, you know, giving some additional citations because the work on um, Anarka, Betsy, Lucy, and the unnamed others, as well as uh, on Sims and his um, his contemporaries. Uh, you know, there's a really amazing um, set of books that have been coming out, and including Deidre Co Cooper Owens' work. Uh, I'd also want to mention Nicole Ivy. She's got an essay in Souls. It's stunning. Um, I also want to lift up the Anarka Project, uh, which is a collaboration of a number of scholars and artists um, who are uh, working to develop a kind of, or, or who have worked to develop a living memorial to Anarka Betsy Lucy. And I'd also mention Bettina Judd's um, Patient, um, which is thinking about the kind of contemporary experiences of uh, Black women in the medical industrial complex and uh, reading that alongside um, archival fragments from that moment. For me, starting in that place in Black on Both Sides um, was work to, to highlight two things. One, that the, um, you know, the unit of analysis, let's say, uh, in the book is not gender, but racialized gender. Um, and so, you know, to attend to um, the uh, space of the kind of plantation medicine as um, a site for the, the earliest American uh, gender clinic 
is really about resituating um, what is the, I think a more commonplace narrative about the production of transgender, which is usually narrated as a kind of post-World War II, um, you know, it, it involves certain um, understandings of modern medicalized transition. But what I was really invested in, in kind of thinking about is the idea of gender as a colonial system, and, and certainly we can get into that more, but gender as a colonial system um, is inherit some of the ordering logics of race within a kind of, uh, within the kind of uh, uh, um, framework of racial slavery. And so if we're not able to kind of take that on as like as a gender clinic that um, precedes the, the gender clinic post-World War II, then we end up not really being able to fully understand how it is that people are navigating the uh, more uh, readily available or accessible form of, of gender transition post-World War II, that this is actually something that we need to sit with. And, and I think in some ways too, um, you know, there was a real desire and, and I appreciate the, the kind words about um, the citational practice, but, but, but I think that the citational practice mirrors the organization of the book itself as well, in so much as I was deeply um, committed to writing stories of entanglement, where looking at something um, that is explicitly about um, the nurturance and the um, absolute um, commitment to Black and trans lives that also have to, we have to sit with folks who, you know, probably weren't trans, but, but they were in their, in their um, you know, as enslaved uh, uh, Black women, their uh, bodies were made fungible, mutable, able to be technologized, that this is in fact also a way of thinking um, deeply through archives of, dis of, of you know, terrible violence, how it is that something like race and gender get co-articulated. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that answer. And, and thank you for talking about that co-creation in terms of that, the transformation, right? Yeah. And I, I um, and this is not part of the question, but I know that part of what you were also saying in your answer, you're referencing the work of Spillers, of Hortense yes. Spillers, which you didn't, I just wanted to, so yeah. for the people out there who heard that, right, yeah. that it's under, that that's part of the underpinning. And it, and also, I think the way you use her work in the book in relation to this is also just phenomenal, right, and, and, and talking about that entanglement, right. Yeah. Yeah. and the discourse of entanglement. So, okay, you emphasize um, expansiveness and fluidity and the dynamism of gender and blackness in contrast to the societal and scientific narratives of fixity and hierarchy. Can you talk to us a little bit how you demonstrate through this through the histories mm -hmm. of cross-dressing in antebellum North America, which relates to some degree with yeah. what we were just talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, and also thank you for making the references to Spillers explicit. I am a great student of Spillers in so much as, um, you know, I think of often like the, the way that I um, write and think is about um, take like being so struck by somebody's work that it just it becomes the refrain. And so thank you for being explicit because I'm sure that I make, I've made many references to Spillers already. Um, but this gives me an opportunity to be explicit as well <laughs> in your question. Um, so, you know, one of the, um, one of, there's a phrase in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe that, um, you know, I, in some ways I would say Black on Both Sides is just an attempt to take that seriously. And it's, it's when Spillers um, talks about how, uh, gender distinction is lost as a consequence of uh, slavery. And that instead, what we have is a field of political and cultural maneuver. And um, there's so many valences there that I was working to, um, to concretize or to narrate or to think with, as I was also thinking with um, figures that I encountered in the archive. One of those valences has to do with gender 
excuse me, as um, not something that is possessable, but rather that it is a technique. And so um, that certainly is the kind of sensibility around the chapter where, you know, on, in one sense, I was so struck and curious about the fact that many people, um, you know, change their, uh, their gendered appearance as a way to uh, move across the Mason-Dixon line. And I think often, um, you know, there was a, there was a kind of interpretation of that as like, yeah, they were, you know, they were tricking folks and, 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 and sure that, that there, there was a kind of performance of trickery that was, that was at play. But I wanted to sit again with what would it mean for gender to be a place of political and cultural maneuver? One is that then I would not um, assign something like uh, cisgender to um, these, the, these folks' ex experience, and rather to allow this kind of site of trans, uh, you know, and, and, and we've been using the word transformation in this conversation, but to think about what it, it was, what it means to transform one's, one's body that is paradoxically also um, uh, rendered as property at this moment, to remake that body in order to move oneself into some other mode of living, some other form of personhood. Um, the other kind of part of that is, is, I think, you know, what I hope that chapter um, brings to the contemporary moment, which is that, like, we can continue to think about gender as a technique, gender as a strategy for living. Um, and that's certainly inspiring some of the, you know, work that I'm, I'm working to develop now about um, non-binary as a kind of context or orientation for thinking about um, robust modes of Black solidarity. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. I have so many questions I just want to ask about that, but I'm going to continue on and we can maybe come back to some of those questions and maybe and in the audience, you can start dropping questions because we're going to open it up in just about 10 minutes. So can you speak a little bit about how anti blackness and anti transness factors into the media representations of black trans people over time using the histories that you've obviously explored in your text. And I'm speaking here specifically of chapter four in your analysis of media representations of Christine, excuse me, Christine, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Like I'm just fumbling over my words, sorry about this. <laughs> oh Christine God. Jorgensen and her whiteness and transness in the juxtaposition to representations of blackness and transness. And um, you'll talk about, I'm not gonna give the history of Christine. You can talk a little bit about that, sure. in terms of what, which, how you address it in the book. Yeah, yeah. So in, in some sense, Christine, um, you know, Jorgensen is kind of the, one of the um, key figures in a lot of trans historiography. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of, I think, the most succinct ways of describing her is she's the first trans celebrity, um, international celebrity. And um, the kind of story of her going to Denmark and, um, uh, having a medical treatment, a kind of surgery, and returning, um, you know, to the U.S. Uh, really animated the international imaginary for many years, and I think, you know, Susan Stryker and others have been very, um, you know, uh, like they they provided excellent analysis for how to think about her as a figure that helped to as a, a figure and a lightning rod really around people's anxieties about the um, expansiveness of what seemed possible in technology following World War II. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns I had as I was working on the project was that there were very few, if any, references to um, trans people of color in that moment. Um, and the really the only person that I was able to encounter through secondary sources was Carlette Brown, uh, a shake dancer from Harlem, who was um, in fact, in some places referred to as the black Christine Jorgensen. And I was like, well, I don't even know what would be the structures that would make that possible. But as I was looking um, across Ebony and Jet and the ways that they were both handling 
the celebrity of Christine Jorgensen and reporting on trans folks, uh, not in, you know, they, it wasn't like great representation, but it was a way of trying to write through that Black folks were also making trans lives. And um, in that, in, in the context of that archive, I was really drawn to how it was that even as the kind of framing was often salacious, uh, there was something about these narratives that exceeded um, their kind of, um, let's say the kind of baseline of trans animus that was like present in the text. And I was often really moved by moments where they were quoted themselves or moments where, and I think that this was, this is something um, that mirrors even the organization in the, in the magazines where you would find them. So like often you would see on the top right hand corner, which is usually like the, the place where uh, a magazine is trying to get you to buy it, right? So like, they'd be like, they would have a story about trans people usually or about racial passing or about some form of, se of, of um, sexuality. Um, so they had like nudist colonies and stuff like that. So they're all in this right hand corner. And often the kind of place that they ended up resolving some of these stories of figures like Georgia Black, uh, like Jim, Jim McCarris, was that they'd be like, oh, isn't it so wild? Like, shouldn't we be so concerned? And yet these people are loved. And I, would, I, I had to sit with the fact that even as they kept reproducing a story that was about a kind of, you know, it's a disavow that is simultaneously an entanglement. That there was also a sense of um, these people have community. These people uh, are are um, are a, a part of the places that they are embedded, but they are also a part of a kind of conversation that's happening across Ebony and Jet and their Black leaderships. Um, and so, you know, I think in some ways that's a that was that the intention of focusing on these narratives from Ebony and Jet and to think about the very material um, consequences of a figure like Christine Jorgensen when um, the idea of being able to medically transition was sort of being enacted upon Christine Jorgensen's body. The, you know, the, the, the country of Denmark told everybody, well, we're not, we don't want any more of you. Um, and where these black trans folks who are often working class we're not able to uh, finance these sort of, um, you know, international trips for for such purposes, uh, and so you know, in, in that sense, to kind of think about um, anti-blackness, uh, anti-transness, or transanimus, or transphobia, but also alongside um, many of the pervasive ways that we understand how uh, power and hierarchy work. That is, that these folks were often working class and working poor that these folks were also, um, you know, criminalized for a variety of reasons. And I, I can't believe it took me this long in the answer to say that like, so often how it is that we come to even find out about these figures is because they were criminalized for their existence. Um, so I hope, I mean, I hope that that sort of gets into what I saw as some of the inter, inter um, locking points and also, you know, what it would, what it would mean to shift the conversation away from the more available figure of a Christine Jorgensen and subsequently of a Brandon Tina. And then I think perhaps, you know, we might even say someone like a Caitlyn Jenner, right? That like, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of an avail availability of a particular kind of visibility that um, is often at, at tension with. Um, a whole host of figures that may or may not have been um, incredibly visible or, or, or elevated to the status of a celebrity, but who lived extraordinary, in extraordinary ways in their ordinary lives that I think um, provide, I think, uh, such, such an important um, uh, blueprint, roadmap, atlas, routier for what it means to live today.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think that's so important in terms of bringing those legacies forward. Like I talked about even in the introduction that told and untold stories, right? And those yeah. legacies and lives. So yeah. thank you so much. I'm gonna combine two of my questions because the next uh, we're gonna go probably into Q and A. And so, as you know, today is um, International Trans Day of Visibility. So I wanna ask you a question both about the ways in which we might think about strengthening right um, um black trans visibility and global movements for black lives so how do we think about situating transness within blm right uh -huh. um, and we know blm is led by right a very dynamic group so we can talk about that and then conversely right when we think about transgender and justice movements as you were just talking about and sort of the long tail of that how do we ensure that we are continuing to pay attention to the particularities of Black criminality, Blackness, in terms of visibility and invisibility and erasure, et cetera. But, the, but this actually also leads me to a question that I want to make sure I get back to, which is link this to what your desires for the book are, right? Like I, I sort of reckon, and this is the next question, which but is you interweave a lot of things, right? And I talked about sort of the, the citational references, but you really do weave together post-colonial, feminist, queer, trans studies, right, and all these other disciplines. So talk to us a little bit about how you see your work helping to advance, even the in the former question, right, around yeah. Black and trans, um, yeah. in terms of the work that you've been doing uh, to, to showcase these narratives, but also and showcase the individuals, um, but then to showcase, as you just said, the theory that is in work. Um, no, I know that's a big yeah yeah I want to I want to figure apart. out how to get into that but I think I, I love I love thinking those questions simultaneously um so you know hmm, I was trained this is actually great I was trained as a, a person um to, to as a scholar to do visual analysis so I have a media studies background um and uh at a, at a certain point, I encountered this essay from Susan Earps, who makes an argument for post-disciplinarity. And, and, and in her argument, she basically says, all we have are questions and our tools. And um, that was incredibly like uh, uh, um, freeing for me to think through um, as someone who, in order to answer the kinds of questions that I have, it's meant needing to um, needing to avail myself of my colleagues who have had that those other forms of specific training um, and and to continue to practice being a student. And so I I think as it relates to the interweaving of various disciplines or fields that deeply has to do with feeling like, the real place that I land in the work is what does it mean to be faithful to the figures, faithful to the narrative, um, and to sort of <laughs> reach out for whatever feels like that is that is actually the thing that I can do. I, I want to mention um, an essay from my colleague at U Chicago. Actually, Kara Keeling has this amazing essay, "Looking for M." where she draws this distinction between what does it mean to look for versus look after the subjects of our work. And I often think about what does it mean, you know, that distinction, the look for as in the kind of impetus to circle, right, to get it right, that there's something beyond accuracy, actually, that we might want to strive toward, that there's something like maybe substituting method for ethics that we might want to strive toward. Um, and so, so I'll segue then into thinking about um, the kind of what it means to be in this conversation today and, and thinking about visibility. Um, and again, being trained as, a, as a, a scholar of visual analysis, I have a very complicated relationship to the notion of visibility. Um, I think of it as, as paradoxical um, in so much as, uh, you know, it, it can be a site for community building and base building. Um, I think it's important. Um, in those respects, I also think that it's a site of possible uh, vulnerability and harm, and, and that you know those things all um, are are those are all possibilities in the space of what it means to be visible. And yet, when we think about the 
kind of leadership uh, around Black Lives Matter and the, and the global movement for Black lives. And we think about the leadership as it relates to um, gender justice movements at the time. It's important to affirm so many of these leaders are Black trans leaders from Raquel Willis to um, you know, Marquise Wilson to a number of the organizations um, that I think, um, you know, have been at the forefront of what is in this kind of COVID era as well, a way of life, which is mutual aid. And so I think about Black trans futures, Black trans media, that there have been so many groups. And part of what, um, you know, I think living through and with COVID has been has meant for folks has has been about um, having a great deal of your mind also focused on survival, and I think a lot about what it means to be within communities of survival. Um, that that there there are lessons that are um, able to be fully affirmed and acknowledged in a moment when so many more are focused on these strategies. Um, when I think about also, like, what is it that would look like, what would a world um, that is uh, liberatory for Black trans people to live in, like, what would that world require? Um, and, and in some ways, I think that it would require, I mean, in every way, right? Like the necessary is that we have to, we have to move towards full decriminalization. I am also a, a deep student and um, a, a person that affirms the kind of work of prison industrial complex abolitionism. Um, and, you know, I think it also means that uh, visibility is perhaps um, you know, is not seen as the opportunity for the quote other to identify, but rather that like these modes of visibility might become a vehicle for um, folks to sit with what they would gain if they were willing to give certain things up. And I think that that's also where Black on Both Sides ends in terms of thinking about the, the untold and muted life of Philip Devine within the kind of larger media story that circulates around Brandon Tina and the Humboldt uh, murders, um, which is that like, you know, to talk about a figure who, you know, there, there are so few sources on Philip Devine and his living. And, and I also, you know, inspired by Audre Lorde, but also deeply reading with, um, um, Sadia Hartman's work on critical fabulation and, and um, Sylvia Winter's work as well. Um, I wanted to kind of quote, invent a life um, for Philip Devine in the absence of, of, of the kind of archival material that would bear out um, any sort of necessary choices or, or a sense of, of what he might have thought or felt. And in that way, I was interested in also marking that, um, you know, there's a there's a a real ethical and political imperative to honor that life, that unknowable life, and that in fact, in many ways, we're actually all in the business of inventing our lives, of sitting with certain uncertainties, and to me, you know, I, this is something that I feel like I'm I'm particularly grappling with at this moment. It's like what what is politically possible from the position of uncertainty that rather than sitting with how do we secure something and make sure and make sure of something what if we sat with the question of like yeah there are things that are actually unknowable there are things that i'm deeply uncertain about and that that guides me to a process hopefully of something like humility and entanglement as a mode of being with others um so yeah, so I, I, I sort of stretched all over. No, the that is great. And questions. I think the way that you brought in COVID and just what you said, right? Maybe we will be different. I've been yeah. using this phrase, not normal, new, different yeah. than where we were yeah. before. And in yeah. terms of thinking about the entanglements that you've just talked about. 
And I and I also want to go back to that notion that you you talked about in terms of right looking after and the nurturing ethics that you're mm -hmm. that you're sort of right referencing. So yeah, you got to it all. Thank you so much. And it was a complicated question. We do have some questions from the audience, and so I'm going to turn to one of those now. Thank you, Jasper Florak. I hope I'm pronouncing your name for your question. Um, and so uh, and thanks for the amazing conversation. That's how it starts. Could you elaborate a little on the history of non-binary and blackness and how it might be employed as a site of cultural and political maneuvering today? Yeah, yeah. thanks for that question um, and the kind words. Um, so I've been, so there is a lot of of, of uh, archival material that never ended up in black on both sides. And um, one figure who I've been sitting with, um, at least since I began writing Black on Both Sides, is this figure who goes by many names, but is often referred to as um, uh, Cathay Williams, William Cathay, who um, is most often described as the first Black woman to be in the US military. Um, and if you look at uh, the full archival um, um, uh, set of materials about this person's life, one would come to find that they lived multiple genders under multiple names for the entirety of their life. And their life story is, is wildly fascinating from being born um, uh, during the time of slavery in uh, Independence, Missouri, being more than likely conscripted into the Civil War, uh, leaving and then becoming a Buffalo soldier, heading out to the West and becoming a, a, a founder of a school in Pueblo, New Mexico. And so I've been thinking a lot about how that figure also um, helps us to think about gender as a site of cultural and political maneuver. What does it mean for them to move through so many um, epics of U.S. history uh, and, and not always, um, not always, quote unquote, as the hero, right? Like to think about the entanglement, too, of what it means to be a Buffalo soldier and to be a, enlisted to take part in um, uh, the uh, state's genocidal project with Native folks. Um, so, so this is a figure that I know that I have to return to in this project that I'm thinking about for non-binary, where it's, um, you know, I think much like Black on Both Sides, where trans is as much affixed, affixed to people as it is as a, a kind of thinking about an analytic, I'm also thinking about not, what is non-binary as, as an analytic. And I've been inspired by um, you know, the, the, the work of S.A. Smythe, who's a poet who's been working in these uh, veins. Um, also, um, Tiffany Lothobo King has uh, uh, the Black Shoals. Um, she describes the Shoals as a non-binary place. And so I've been sitting with that question, um, uh, that, that provocation. So this project is really, uh, you know, to think about what, um, what it means to, to, to stand in a position of the neither nor and the yes and all at once as a way of, again, I think this is, this is to go to uh, uh, something I, I said earlier, um, to, to imagine what we gain when we give things up and, and what would it mean to like give up gender as a thing that we think we possess. Um, what then might non-binary as, as a kind of um, philosophical orientation open up in terms of um, various modes of, uh, of orienting towards justice. And, you know, I think that that's also, and this is sort of picking up on, on the, the last, uh, your response to, my, to the last question, um, which is like, I've been sitting a lot with a tweet that Imani Perry put up um, that was like, uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the troubling um, events around Yana Dor, who was uh, beaten in uh, Minneapolis uh, within days of uh, George Floyd's murder and um, in the, in, in the, the time span of when there was great uprising, political uprising there and across the world. And Imani Poe wrote, like, we actually have to be attentive to who it is that we need to be 
to show up in the world that we're working to create with each other. And I wonder if non-binary is, is, is one of the modes that we need to embrace, that there's actually, while I can affirm as, as, a, as, a, as a, a Black feminist and as a person who's a, stu a, a student of Black feminisms, that like the specificity of a position of Black women is, is deeply important and, and, and has been a site for great transformation and social change. I am also interested in thinking about what it might mean to think about relation outside of um, the space of normative traditional genderings. Thank you so much. I can't believe we're running out of time. So I have two questions and I need you to ask him, answer them in two minutes. So the first question is from Beck Hurdle. Her, Hurdle, I hope I'm, you know, I can't see things. So I think that's the last name. And if I've mispronounced your name, last name, I apologize. What are your thoughts on how trans identities are discussed and taught in higher ed classrooms? And I'm gonna also just give you the last question so you know, which is we focus a lot on joy, you know this. So we asked you this question, but tell us a little bit about your um, hope, your joy for the, you know, thinking about joy and hope for the future in terms of the work and your work. So. One is just tell us a little bit about what's happening in those classrooms and gender identity and then second hope and joy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So it's hard to make a, a kind of meta analysis of how trans is being just like taught in, in higher ed. I, I can say that one aspect of what has been really amazing to me at the University of Chicago is that I've um, this is the first time in my career that I've been at a place where there are more, I'm not the only one who works in trans studies. And I find that really, um, really exciting. Um, it feels like a space to build. Um, and I've been, I've been heartened by um, seeing more and more that people feel a real palpable sense of collegiality. Um, and so I, I think that that obviously has impact in the classroom. Um, and so this is part of what, I, I mean, I, I think, signaling that I feel like I'm a part of something, that I'm part of a, of, a, of a kind of community that's rooted in a specific place, but exceeds that place as part of the kind of practice of being available to joy, which I think of a lot, that there's a lot of practices. Um, I think key among them is a kind of practice of gratitude and acknowledgement, and that that becomes the grounds by which one might find and like fully relish in the moments where joy is possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been amazing. I have I have so many questions I would follow up on, and uh, people are asking for the uh, citational references. Let me say this: get the books, get the books. We wish you had we had more time, but if you get the books, there's something in the back. It's yeah. like an index. <laughs> it has all the references, and then you'll buy the next book, and you'll have even more references. Thank you, Dr. Snorton, for being with us today. You, you are, these books are amazing, your contributions, and we look forward to your work, to the emerging work. Uh, and thank you for uh, shouting out uh, uh, some of the professors here and even some of the people that we featured, like uh, Raquel Wellis and Imani Perry. Thank awesome. you for joining us for this Global Scholars and Innovators. Again, this program has been recorded and will be available for you to use in your classes or excerpts or whatever you'd like. Again, please take really good care out there. These are still remain challenging times in multiple ways. We have multiple issues and uh, affecting communities all across the globe. So take care of yourself and others. Thank you to our team, uh, to the team behind the scenes, to all of those people who made today possible, to our closed captioners, to the uh, entire social, uh, to all of the people who work on social media. And again, to our, my team in OGI, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Chris and Christopher for all of your work in the LGBTQ plus center. And again, remember it's the 25th anniversary. So look, at, uh, look us up and uh, keep, uh, uh, look, us, uh, look up our programs. Thanks again for being here today. Bye thank everyone. You.